My name is Bert Catino, and I was brought up on the Monterey Peninsula. I was born here August 7, 1939, and from a family of commercial fishermen. That was my heritage, commercial fishing. As you can see down here in beautiful Monterey, the Fisherman's Wharf, and all the wonderful boats that used to be out there, the fishermen, that's my history. My family came here because of this industry that was started. My grandfather on my mother's side came in here after the turn of the century, actually 1906, right after the earthquake in San Francisco. But many of the fishermen here, of course, were Sicilians. And the first group that came were from a small town in Sicily, right off Palermo, called Isola della Femina. Don't get me wrong, the island of women, it's not. It's the island next to the peninsula. Actually, it's Eufemma, but they changed it to Femina because I guess it was just easier saying Femina instead of Eufemina. But anyway, that was the beginning of the history here of the fishing industry. My grandfather, my father, and my mother's side, father's side, they all were, were in the commercial fishing business, and they were here. They had fishing boats, or they worked on fishing boats. At one time, we had one of the biggest boats in the bay called the Gatino Brothers. That was my uncle. And my father actually came here after the First World War. He was in the Italian Navy, and he came here in 1920. And of course, his brothers were here before him, and, and that's how family kept bringing more family here, which they needed to have both sides. And I say both sides because if they fished on the boats, what about the women? And the women went to work in the canneries. So you see, my mother worked in the canneries, my grandmother worked in the canneries, and the men were on the fishing boats. So it gave everybody a livelihood. And the sardines, of course, that were so plenty at the time. Now, unfortunately, at when I turned 13, 1952, the sardine industry began to collapse. And I really didn't see sardines when I went out fishing with my father on his boat called the Santa Rosalia that he built in 1948, about a 40-footer. We end up getting squid, excuse me, calamari. That's what it's called now. <laughs> As everybody knows, they can eat it. But squid, they're not going to eat. Calamari, they're going to eat. But that became as you know, a very popular item as it is today. And I found myself looking at no future because if the fishing industry collapsed, my relatives, whether they are involved in fish markets or canneries or boats, the tendency was to probably lose everything in a matter of time. Who knew when the sardines were going to come back? Nobody knew. It's just that it was such a shock to everybody that they disappeared. And you got to remember, those big fishing boats they had out there, they called Persaders. You know, they were like $200,000 that were built in the 20s and the 30s. And now these boats in the 50s end up selling for about $10,000. So it was a kind of a very much a depression going on. And a lot of people, you know, were they going to stay in an area that all of a sudden doesn't produce for them? The fishing industry collapsed. There's not enough there for everybody. A lot of my friends, some of them left the area, of course, because a lot of the sons who were going to be going fishing taken over. My brother, for example, he was a uh, coach. He became a coach. He loved to go come down and go help my father out and still go fishing sometimes. He became a famous coach at Cal for 25 years. And he even wrote a book called A View from Garlic Hill, which really depicts growing up in Monterey. You could take that same story of him growing up and it'd be my story and it'd be my, my buddy's story down the block or my cousin's. And we were all in the same format. Even got so a point that everything was so much the same. I know what nights we would have pasta night on a Thursday night and I'd go to anybody's house, they'd be serving the same thing and they'd be serving the same thing on Sunday. I mean, that's how everything was done that, in those days. I found myself saying, this is not for me. And my brother got a lifeguard job out at Homan's Guest Ranch in Carmel Valley. And it was a summer job, and he was the lifeguard, and that was great. And he says to me, he says, they need a dishwasher. How would you like to wash dishes? I says, see, that'd be great, anything. You know, even though I had a paper route and all these other things as a kid, but I thought washing dishes or something, 
what's the big deal at that? At my house, 20, 30 people was nothing. We were washing dishes, cooking, making raviolis, doing all these things when I was five years old. So there was no surprises for me. So my brother says to me, he says, well, look, and he says, you come out and get an opportunity to come out to the pool and relax, and then they got horses, and you can go out and ride horses. Well, you know, 13-year-old kid, that's like, what's 30 cents an hour? That doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm thinking of all the great fun I was going to have. Anyway, my parents were very objective to me taking that job and started to work my brother over, but I was adamant about doing it. So I went out there for the summer, and I found out washing dishes, no automatic dishwasher by hand, <laughs> three meals a day. I don't think I saw daylight. <laughs> the chef, I remember the German chef that was there, he was telling me, he says, you like to cook, you know, and I says, yeah, anything's better than washing dishes. So this one day he makes spaghetti. And the Mr. Holman, who owned Holman's department store in Pacific Grove, but he was like a wrangler. He, he owned this ranch, and this was sort of like his, you know, his, his way of getting away <laughs> from maybe business and, and doing what he wanted to do, ride horses and all that. He'd come in and eat the employee meal, and basically this is spaghetti was for the employee meal. Well, the chef said to me, I see you don't, you're not eating my spaghetti. I said, chef, I says, I'm Sicilian, you know, we, oh, he says, you think you could make it better? Cocky as I was then, I said, yes. <laughs> he says, next time you're going to make it. <laughs> he tells me like that. So that time came up, and he made spaghetti, and I went down there early in the morning. I made the sauce and all that. I remember the chef very really coming in about 7 o'clock, and I had the sauce going and everything, and he, and he says to me, well, let me see what you've done so far. And he tasted it, and he kind of went back like this, and he says, good. He just said good, not very good, just said good. And I says, okay, chef, we'll see what happens. He says, okay, so Mr. Holman comes in about 11.30, right before lunchtime, and he says, chef, chef, what do you got for the help today? He says, we got spaghetti alla catino. And he says, spaghetti alla what? He says, spaghetti alla catino. He says, let me taste that. So <laughs> chef gives him a plate. He tastes, takes one little bite of that, goes like this, goes like that, puts the plate down. He says, chef, don't you serve this. And I says, that's it. I'm done. I'm fired. I'm gone. He says, serve this to the customers, not the employees, to the customers. <laughs> so chef turns to me and he says, Mr. Holman liked your spaghetti. I says, yeah, I can see that, chef. He says, you want to learn how to cook? I said, well, I was hoping because I want to do, you know. He says, okay, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you more about cooking and stuff. And he was a very well-trained chef, by the way, and because uh, we had a lot of celebrities out there. This is very high-end st stuff, you know. So I start to take my apron off, and I figure I'm going to wear the hat, wear the white coat. He says, what are you doing? I says, well, I'm going to learn how to cook. He says, no, in between my shift, in between my shift. But I got to tell you something. <laughs> I was getting 30 cents an hour, right? He gave me a five cent raise. Okay, I didn't get it. So that day I was very upset. The chef says, what's the matter with you today? I says, nothing, chef. He says, oh, let me see your check. So I pulled out my check and looked at it. He says, come with me. And Mr. Holman's daughter from college was working in the accounting department for the summer. And he goes to her and he says, well, you didn't pay my boy the raise I gave him. Oh, chef, I'm so sorry. This and that. She gets the check. She looks at it. She refers. Oh, it's right, chef. She says, no, it's not right. He says, but he's a dishwasher. He says, you see this hat? When this hat comes off, I'm out of here. You take care of my boy. Wow, I was so impressed. I went back and I told the chef, I said, gee, chef, I don't want to thank you. He said, what are you thanking me for? If you're not worth it, you shouldn't get it. But if you are, you make sure they always pay you right. Anyway, that was kind of experience. And I says, you know, cooking kind of came to me kind of easy. It was like no big deal. But I eventually ended up working down on the wharf and working at the old Cerritos at the wharf. And Cerritos at the wharf used to be the old Pop Ernest restaurant. Pop Ernest, the originator of the abalone. I was working there, bussing tables and 
I still wanted to get back in the kitchen and learn more about food. And not that I had really inklings to be a chef. I don't think that's where I was going. But I wanted to know more about the business, and I wanted to learn about the business. In the meantime, I was, uh, you know, just getting out of high school at this point now that I'm working for the last three or four years, still going part-time fishing once in a while with my dad. <laughs> Sometimes he says, how come you're late for class, you know? Well, because I was fishing that night. He says, what do you mean fishing? I says, commercial fishing. <laughs> oh, that's different. <laughs> I began to really enjoy it. So then I took an apprenticeship. Actually, there was a great chef at Neptune's Table, which is also Cerrito Operation. His name was Louis Bodak. And Louis let me work in his kitchen. And Louis was a very European trained chef. He worked on cruise ships and he worked in, well, he just worked all over the world. And his food was so great. I mean, he was the top restaurant, if not just on the wharf. I think he was the top restaurant in the area at the time. And I'm talking 1958, 1959, in that era. I ended up working back there with him, going through an apprenticeship program, which is really a three-year apprenticeship program. He was a member of the American Culinary Federation, which is a national chef's organization. I was certified through the apprenticeship program for three years, working for him in the back, and then working out front for pay. So when I worked for him, though, I didn't get paid. But it was an education that you couldn't, you know, we served the King of Belgium one time. We learned how to make ice carving and desserts. And he just taught me all kinds of secrets that even today that I use in my own business. That's how amazing that was. And eventually I ended up becoming manager of that restaurant over a period of time. And I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco State and get a maybe a degree and go into full time as in management. But I got lured by my boss because he kind of took me under his wing and he had other restaurants and eventually I was operating five of them. And then I had a call from the military. I got drafted in the army because I wasn't keeping up in college. I was going to college part time, you know, running, running restaurants and going part time. That's kind of crazy at the time. But hours didn't make any difference to me. It still does it today. And <laughs> so I got this call for the Army. And then down at Neptune's table uh, on Sundays when the Navy Reserve was meeting, the Admiral would come in or the Captain would come in. And I would serve them the best table in the house a half hour early when they came in. They came in this one Sunday and they saw I wasn't as gracious as I normally am. I guess I was a little depressed that I got called in the military. And the Admiral says, what's the matter with you today, Bert? And I says, well, I won't be seating you people down here anymore. I says, because I'm going in the Army. You're not going in the Army. You're going to Navy. Stand up. I say, I'm standing up. Raise your right hand. Swore me in in the Navy Reserve right at the table, at Neptune's table. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so now I thought, being a reserve, you know, what the heck? I don't have to worry about active duty and all this other stuff. Well, that's not the case. You got to go two years active and five years reserve. You either take your two years first or you take your two years after. And I figured well, I might as well go in. But unfortunately, they, <laughs> I figured I might as well go see the world going in the Navy. You know, after all, that's what sailors do. They go all over the world. I got stationed in Alameda, California, because they put me in the hospital and they put me as a medic. I had to go through training, uh, nurses training for 12, I couldn't figure me doing all this stuff. But I did surgery, I gave shots, I did all this thing. But I gotta tell you something, that really worked for me in the culinary profession, the sanitation part, the cross-contamination part, because I had a lot of training in that. And I used it when I got certified as a certified executive chef, because I had that background, and it really helped. But then from there, you know, working at Cerritos and and getting back after the Navy and ended up my last six month station in Monterey, <laughs> which is kind of, kind of crazy. I, I swapped with someone who lived in Alameda and I ended up coming to Monterey the last six months. I don't think I wore the uniform half of that time because the doctor at the station here was Dr. Goble. His family owned three restaurants and he and I became good friends. <laughs> <laughs> While I was up in Alameda, I got to tell you, though, I worked at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. I worked some other restaurants to get some experience and more knowledge. In the meantime, I was continually studying the profession and the business. And my greatest thinking at the time was I wanted to go in business. After all, you know, working for somebody else, then you say you want to do it for yourself. You put it in 16 hours a day. And I had a great opportunity with uh, 
guy that I met in college. His name is Ted Ballesturi. He was from the East Coast. Ted and I, there's a little story there too. We were in economics class at MPC and we were talking so much in the back that the teacher says, you two fellas come up forward here. He put us up in front and he says, this is a good example of two gentlemen who will never succeed because they're not listening to what's going on in this class. I work out with that teacher every now and then. He says, you and Ted were the best students we ever had. I says, yeah, okay. <laughs> Funny how things change. <laughs> but from that, you know, uh, Ted uh, ended up coming up to the Monterey area, working at another restaurant here. And we kind of talked continually to say we want to open up our own restaurant. Opportunity came up on Cannery Row. We saw a dilapidated old building. I remember when I was in high school, we used to go to engagement parties there with the old Spanish Aurora Hall. Actually built as a cafeteria to feed the sardine workers. You know, when they packed the fish, they would pack 24 hours or whatever it took in order to make sure they got completed. And they would have these canteens. They had three canteens down on Cannon Row and where the sardine factory exists today. That's the canteen and it happens to be the Aurora Hall. And we ended up starting our business there. We opened up October 2nd, 1968. We didn't have too much money. Uh, we were on the wrong side of the tracks. We weren't with the view of the Monterey Bay. And Cannery Row, of course, you know, was a dilapidated area. All the canneries went broke. In fact, where the aquarium is today was the old Hoveden Cannery. My father fished for that cannery for 35 years. And that was the last one to close in 1962. So uh, October 2nd, 1968, we'd opened up the sardine factory. I was the chef and then my partner worked the front. And we had a doctor, Dr. Caselli, who was a dentist that also was involved with us and helped. And uh, that's the time we learned a lot about the business, the real business of operating because, you know, there's a lot of in integral part that you need to know. Even though we worked in many phases of it, you don't know until you open up your own. But, you know, we took minimum wage for ourselves and we worked hard, worked very hard to build that restaurant up. We only had about 50 seats in the dining room, doing like over 200 a night. It was amazing what we did. And, I, you know, I didn't even have a, a refrigerator in a sense. I had a small refrigeration. I had to rent a truck, a refrigerated truck, to use as a walk-in box. <laughs> uh, 50 bucks a month, I'll never forget that. But uh, those were the things and the, and the struggles in order to succeed. You got to... You know, he and I really didn't believe in failure. We just believed we were going to just make this work and it was going to go. In a few years, we opened up another restaurant called The Butcher Shop in Carmel. It was another old restaurant, this Art Bodine, who was a great gentleman. In fact, my partner had worked for him on the restaurant on the wharf that he had here, wharf number two. And he had a small place there, and we just took that over and we converted it into a steakhouse concept. And we were serving prime beef and other things that other people weren't doing. And... And that, pack, uh, that place was packed from day one and did very well. Unfortunately, we're, you know, Ted and I always liked to buy the property. <laughs> I bought my first house at 19 and second house investing. I believed in that. Of course, more excited about the food service industry in a sense, but I think it's good to be diversified in life. And that's how he and I both believed. And anyway, that place was successful. We're trying to buy the property of the butcher shop in Carmel. And the Dowd family owned that property. They owned quite a bit of property in Carmel. And what happened was we shook hands with the owner because he liked us so much. He said, I'm going to sell this to you, but I'm going to Hawaii. He died on the airplane of a heart attack. And you know, the lawyers took over. The rent, you know, they never give you long-term rent leases in Carmel. And I guess it was just destiny that we weren't going to be in Carmel too long. So we ended up selling that restaurant. And we decided to do more on the Canary Road thing. And we saw opportunity there. We ended up meeting with Ben Swig, who owned Canary Road at the time, most of it. And he ended up selling us the good portion of it. And actually, we didn't have too much money in doing that, but I think we had a lot of, we had a lot of guts. And he kind of thought it was great, two young guys that wanted to develop Canary Road because he felt at his stage in his life that wasn't going to happen. So with that, little by little, we kept buying more and keep reinvesting in the Cannery Row area. As it is today, you can see what has been developed through that. And it's been certainly, but I spent a lot of time still, I'm at the sardine factory. You know, we, 
we had other restaurants. We had fast food restaurants, and but this the sardine factory is still my baby in a sense. I like being there. I love being there. In fact, my wife says sometimes you love that more than me. I said sometimes it's debatable. I almost got divorced over that one. <laughs> but but seriously though, the the restaurant in any industry or anything you're in, I think passion is the key. You got to love it. It's not the money. You know, I just love being down there, meeting people, seeing people, or being in the kitchen, working with my staff. In fact, we have a chef with us now. Is someone I trained 20 years ago. He's now the executive chef. We have staff that have been with me 36 years, 39 years, bartender, Big Mike. He's still there behind the bar. Gasper, my sous chef, 28 years. We have waiters that have been with us 25 years. In fact, in some cases, you know, the father has has retired and the son has taken over in the wait staff. So it's been a great thing. It's more like a family type scenario. Even though my partner and I, our wives are not in our business, we were hoping maybe our sons were. My two sons came in. My older son, Mark, took over the wine. He discovered wine and eventually became the cellar master. And then my younger son became the general manager. Now you'd think that these two young guys would be so thrilled being where they were at. Well, my son Mark, he got a big offer with Talbot, and he ended up now with Talbot Wines. He said they paid him better. I says, take it. <laughs> and my younger son, he's telling me how I should invest my money. He became a money manager type guy, you know. And he's telling me on that deal, and I says, okay, fine. Let me know when and where. <laughs> but anyway, my father always said very simply, he says, look it. I told my brother and myself, and of course I had two sisters, but he told my brother and he says, look it, he says, whatever you want to do is okay with me. He says, the most important thing in your life is to be happy. You want to be president? Be president. You want to be just the garbage man? Be the garbage man. But as long as you're happy in your life is okay. So it was never peer pressure from my father, from my brother, or myself. My brother, as I said, went on and became a great, one of the most famous water polo coaches in the world. He did his thing. I got involved in the restaurant business, as you know, and then now I'm involved in a culinary school, but I've been involved in my national organization, the ACF. I was chairman of the Academy of Chefs, which is an honor society. I promote culinary education throughout the country. I'm on many boards, advisory boards for schools. Raising money for scholarship is one of my key points and giving back to this industry that's been so good to me.